Welcome to the Launch and Learn Marketing Series. Today's session is all about how to turn your website into a sales machine. And if you want to catch the others, they're on our YouTube channel. The last workshop in our series, which will be number four, is going to focus on how to take the stress out of your business planning by pulling everything together from your ideal market research, crafting your story, and projecting your future results. So you don't want to miss that one either. All right, so we should have our poll completed and let's share the results. All right, so we've got most people are either startup or growing. Few people mature, all right. And how many people work in your business? Very highly skewed to just me. Okay, so it's a one person. And part of that's because several of you are startups and some of you have one or two other people. So that's cool. All right, now let's see what we got for business choices. All right, we got retail coming out at 9%, professional or service at 82% and e-commerce at 9%. We've yet to have farming. Do you have a website? Okay, nobody said they're converting to sales well because why would you bother coming to this workshop? Okay, now we've got 18% where people are visiting and they click on the call to action and don't convert. Okay, that's interesting. And we've got none that said most people click away. And then we've got 36% people don't come. All right. And 42% don't have, 45% don't even have one. Okay, so for those of you who don't have one, this is great because you can, you have the opportunity to fix it before it even starts, which is perfect. And for those of you who have a website and are having challenges, then we'll talk about that too. All right. So the purpose of your website is sales. Now, it's not always direct or immediate sales, and we're going to get into that later, but it is always about sales. And there are three things that you need for your website to translate into sales. One is good design, two, clear communication, and three, a strong call to action. So when your website doesn't convert, it's usually one of those three problems. So how do you know if your website is converting? Because you may have the idea that it is or isn't, but how do you actually know? What you wanna do is you want to evaluate your conversion rate before you do anything else. If you have a website already, and you want to compare your conversion rate against the standard conversion rate for your type of business or industry. And you can Google to find what the standard conversion rates were. I pulled this off of somebody's website. So this is pretty generic. They just broke it down into e-commerce, business to business, legal and finance. I don't know why they picked those categories because they kind of aren't similar to each other, but whatever. So you can see that the standard conversion rate fluctuates all over the place, depending on what it is that you do. And there's a bottom and middle and top. So you may think, oh, my conversion rate's terrible. But if you're an e-commerce business and you're getting 6%, that's actually really good. So it's sometimes our perception is, makes us think we're better or worse than we actually are. So how do you calculate the conversion rate, you might ask, this is the formula. It's the number of conversions you have, which is the number of actions taken on your website. So it depends on what your action is, divided by the total number of visitors times 100. That tells you the percentage of people who convert on your website. Now, in order to do this calculation, you have to have some sort of analytics tool in place. Oftentimes that's Google Analytics. If you have a 
a Shopify website or, or specified website, they may have other tools in place. I'm not really that familiar with Shopify to know whether they have their own analytics tools or not. So if you have built this website yourself, or if you have, if you're using specified tools like say a Shopify or um, there's another one that that's a membership site. If you have a membership site and they have specific tools, you're going to have to, you're going to want to Google it or go to the help on those particular tools. Otherwise, if you have a web designer, you're going to want to speak to the web designer to make sure that your web designer builds this capacity into your site so that you can actually calculate this to see how it's doing. Now, again, as I said before, if it turns out you're at the high end already, after you Google this and find out what the standard rate is for your business, it may not get better than that. That might just be good. And so the key is to get more people at the front end, which isn't really to do with this class. This class is more about what to do when people already land on your site. So you might have to deal more with the social media side or networking or whatever it takes to get people to come to you. But if you implement everything that we talk about that we talked about in the first two workshops, which was about your target market and telling your story. And what we cover here today, you might actually do better than the high end because again, that's still an average high end. So, and if you're nowhere near the high end, then there's plenty of room for improvement anyway. So the rest of the session here today is gonna to focus on how to where to figure out and what to do when the traffic is falling off. So if you determine you want better or you have, don't even have a website as 45% of you said, how can you make the website give you the best chance of success right out of the gate? So if you have an existing website, the, the question now to ask yourself is where in the marketing funnel is the problem happening? Where, where is it not converting? And so I have don'ts, which I'm going to show one at a time and talk through. The first one is they don't even visit, which 36% of you said they don't even come. Unfortunately, that's not going to be covered in this class because this class is about the website itself. So yes, there are things that you can do to your website, such as SEO and things like that, that I am not an expert at, that I believe, in fact, I am positive we have a workshop on our YouTube page that talks about SEO. And so I would encourage you to check that out because the things that get people to visit are the things that you do outside your website to get people to come to your website. So it's going to be Google My Business. It's going to be SEO optimization on the website itself. It's going to be social media posting. It's going to be networking. It's going to be going and doing public speaking. It's going to be doing all the things that help people to know who you are and like and trust you enough to want to come and visit your website. And definitely SEO is a part of that but that is definitely a whole class by itself. It's way complicated. So also, if you wanna work with a SCORE mentor, this could be a topic for your SCORE mentor. So the other two are click. If people visit your website and they click on nothing, you say, sign up for I, my email list and they don't or you say, schedule a call, and they don't. They click nothing. They just visit your website and then they leave. Now this problem could be any of three problems. It could be the design, it could be the communication isn't clear, and it could also be that the call to action isn't strong enough or clear enough. So if they click on nothing, you, we still haven't narrowed down what the problem is. It could be any one. Lastly, if they don't finish, which means they click on the call to action button and it doesn't convert to an action. 
So they click on the call to action button, which might be buy this if it's a small thing, or it might be schedule an appointment or whatever. And they click that button and then they never do the rest, which sometimes is fill out a form, go to a calendar scheduler and schedule an appointment or whatever it happens to be, sign up for my email, whatever. Usually, if this is where the problem is, then the problem has to do with your communication. That you have not communicated clearly enough who the right person is so that they don't see themselves strongly enough to do whatever work it takes to finish taking the action they started. The second possibility is that the place you take them to is either too confusing or requires too much work for them to do. Because as we said at the other two workshops, if you confuse, you lose. And that includes your website itself. So, so what you always wanna do is balance out how much information you're requiring someone to fill in or how much action you're requiring them to take versus how, so that you have enough information to do whatever you want with it versus how easy it is for them. And many people err too much on the side of requesting too much information up front and not enough making it easy. So we're going to go through that here next. 10 seconds is how long someone looks at your website and decides to click away. If they think they're going to stay, they'll give you an extra 10 seconds before changing their minds. So they decide in the first 10 seconds, no or probably yes. If it's no, they're gone. If it's probably yes, you get 10 more seconds. And this, so you have to catch them in the first 10 seconds. And this is how they look. They start on the left-hand side. They go straight over to the right. They go down on the diagonal and then they go to the right again. So in the form of a Z. So you want the most important stuff to be across the top and over to the right. And then down in the left diagonal corner and then over to the right. And that is all what they see before they have to scroll. And that's what's gonna make them decide if they're gonna either click or scroll. So let's talk about principles of good design. This is the five minute marketing makeover website. I'm using this as an example for a couple of reasons. The first is that they are great examples of what I'm talking about. And the second reason is because they actually have a free tool that helps you diagnose where your problems might be on your website. And I highly recommend going there. It does put them, you on their email list and they're going to obviously try to sell you something later, but the stuff they give away for free is excellent. So principles of good web design are high visual appeal, which means high quality images, color for mood and directing the eye somewhere, fonts, the use of white space, structure and organization, and simplicity. So that's visual appeal is all those things. This website has them in spades. It has an image of the founder. It's not some random nothing person. The color, they chose an orange color because it's for brightness and positivity, but it's a little subdued. So it's not super bright and annoying because after all they're about business. And they also, it also guides your eye to the right, which is get free access. They chose good fonts because they're businessy, but they're not boring. And they use white space really effectively. So it's not crammed with stuff. It's very well organized and it's extremely simple. The language is simple. It's all simple. All right. So the second principle of good design is clear and a concise message. Bingo. Very clear, very concise. The third is a strong call to action. 
bingo, get free access button. You know what you have to do. Two S's, speed and security. You want to know that when you, especially if you're going to buy something or if, if you, the seller, are going to sell something, your website better be secure and it better load instantly because if somebody has to wait, they click away. And the last one is that it's mobile friendly or now what they call it is responsive because it's not just mobile, it's mobile Android, mobile iPhone, mobile old iPhone, new iPhone, mobile tablet of every shape and size. So responsive means it adjusts itself for every possible permutation of, of website, including if you happen to switch the zoom ratio on your, on your browser, on your laptop. So mobile friendly is critical. All right, so before we go any further, we're gonna talk about your call to action or CTA. The big question here is what do you want someone to do when they get to your site? It is amazing how many people cannot answer that question. They just think, oh, I just have to put a website up and somehow magically something happens. But you want to be extremely clear about what do I want someone to do when they come here? If you're an e-commerce site, you could link directly to the shop page on your site. Or it might be, give me your email address in return for something like when you'll to be notified when stuff goes on sale or a first time customer coupon. So even with an e-commerce site, it's not totally clear as to which action you want people to take. It's up to you and you want to choose it and make it super clear and not have multiple choices. If you're a retailer, it could be very similar to the e-commerce situation. It could be provide your email address in return for something of value. Oftentimes a coupon either for your first purchase or when something goes on sale. If you're a service or you're a manufacturer or you're a wholesaler, oftentimes there it's going to be a call for a free consultation to explore working together. Now, if you're a service and or your business, if the product you sell costs more than $1,000, it's always going to take way more than one phone call to close the sale. And the more expensive it is, the more time it's going to take to close the sale. But you still have an initial call to action, which is what do you want them to do first? Sometimes it's a phone call, call right away, call for an appointment. Sometimes it's schedule an appointment, in which case it's gonna be a calendar, or it may be get on my email list. Again, the choice is yours but you always want to make that choice, know what it is and be really clear about it. And you can always have what they call a contingent call to action on a different page. And I'll talk more about that later. This is an example of a man who has both a product and a service. You can see that it says weird copywriting tips, tools, and tactics. A lot of what he sells is online courses to do it yourself. But he also sells workshops that are high end. And so he doesn't want to have a call to action that gears people toward one or the other of those two things he does. So he's got join the Daily Ray newsletter. It's clear what he wants. And he's made this is on his home page. This is at the top. As soon as you get to his website, this is what you see. This one is an example of a software tool. It's very clear what they want you to do. They want you to sign up for free and you can, you can start by downloading the software or you can start by signing up, in which case once you sign up, you'll be downloading the software. So again, really clear. They want you to do one thing, use their software and because you can sign up for free, you, they want you to download it. This one happens to be a manufacturer in Connecticut. 
And for some reason, they have two calls to action. And I don't think I would recommend that. I don't know how good this business is or isn't. I don't know how successful they are or aren't. I don't know how important their website is to them. I just was looking for a manufacturer in case there were any on this class today. And so I would probably put the contact us as the sole call to action and put the learn more section just below the fold, which is just below what you see before you scroll down rather than have it be a button. But that's, that's just me because I think having two makes it confusing and now people don't know what to do. Now, all four of those sites that I showed you had visual appeal. They had good use of fonts. They had good use of colors. They had good use of white space. Although we call it white space, but more and more websites are using black space because they're using black backgrounds with white text. So white space is a generic term meant for kind of open space so that the eye is focused toward what's most important. So which ones were the easiest to scan out of those four? This one, definitely up there. I would put this one definitely at the top of the list. And this one, because they were the fastest. You could, the, you could more easily tell what someone wanted you to do the fastest, within 10 seconds for sure. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about fonts because fonts matter too. And there are tons of tutorials on YouTube about fonts. And I would suggest that you look at some if you're not a designer, which I am not. Fonts are important. You want fonts that reflect your brand or the type of business that you have. And I'm going to show you some examples of good font choices. And these are combinations that were served up in a tool that I use all the time since I'm not a designer and it's called canva.com. And there will be, I'll show it to you on the last slide of this workshop so you can see how it's spelled. The first one is corporate, very corporate, kind of blocky, really easy to read. The next one is artsy. Then we have rustic. Then we have something's on sale. Then we have cute and funky. And then we have classic. So when you scan this slide, you can see how different these fonts are and the feeling you get by the fonts. So important things to note about fonts. Choose fonts that are in keeping with your brand image and the feeling you want your customer to have. Choose colors that are in keeping with your brand image and the feeling you want your customer to have. Keep it simple. Limit your fonts and the sizes of those fonts to a few. The more you have, the more confusing it gets and if you confuse, you lose. Contrast can be your friend and not all the time. So the huge sale one has contrast of color. The one on the left, you're invited to an ice cream parlor has contrast and it's interesting and cool. The one on the right has contrast between what's in the middle and what's on the outsides of what's in the middle. So that what's in the middle is the most important and the other ones are less important. So you can see where contract can, contrast can come in handy. But if that one in the middle was neon yellow or some color that was weird, when this is supposed to be classic, that would be horrible and nobody would like it. So you, you want to make sure that you use contrast that's tasteful and that enhances what you're trying to say and doesn't detract from it in any way. So do not use too many fonts. Do not use too many colors and do not choose combinations that don't go together, which is why I often use these as guidelines because I'm not all that great at picking. Okay, so we've done a call to action and visual appeal. What's next? A clear and concise message. 
which is all about clear communication. So in session one of this series, we talked about your ideal market, which gives you clear language to a specific group of people. In session two, we talked about storytelling, how to tell your story in a way that makes it universal so others feel like they're a part of that story. And even better, if you can invite them to an even bigger story, which has a greater purpose. And so all the copy on your website should be about your customer and not really about you, even when you're talking about yourself. So a perfect example is the five minute marketing makeover. Who is this for? It's for people who are trying to market their business and it's not working so well. They want to increase their sales. So you can see by the questions that are listed at the bottom, they are speaking to that person. This copy clearly spells out the problem the customer is having too. So they're talking about what they want, who they are, and what their problem is. And they made it really simple. Three easy to read boxes with short sentences. This is a definite 10, which it should be because this is what they teach people. So it better be good. They better be modeling what they teach people how to do. All right, here's another example. This was Evernote, the software. Who's this for? This is for people who are on the go, who want to not lose important stuff and they wanna get things done. Now, this one is not as good as the previous one because although we know who it's for and the problem it solves, the design is kind of busy. And I know they want to show their software, but in my mind, they should have made the image smaller because you don't necessarily go and look at the text right away. And in my mind, the text is what people want to focus on. And yeah, they kind of want to see the picture, but I think the picture should be smaller. Here's a third example. This is called ACMT in Manchester. And again, I know nothing about this company. This is a good, clear example of a manufacturer telling a story that focuses on the customer. Now, this could still be improved, but it's a solid, say, seven or eight out of 10. The biggest negative in my mind for this site is that the tagline is all about them and not about the customer. And frankly, the customer doesn't care if they're a global leader. They wanna know what they can do for them. And it, I don't know what they do, except it's something about flying, maybe, except there's a picture of a baby. So, but the design is really clean and easy to scan. And they do talk about our work travels around the globe and eases the transport of so many. So they do talk about the customer, it's just not at the top. And this website is super responsive and it loads really quickly. So they get high marks there. All right, so we've got call to action. Have one, make it really clear. We talked about design with colors and fonts and white space and responsiveness. We talked about communication, messaging, that it's clear, that it's to one customer, that it's about them. You are the guide, they are the hero. So now it's time to get a little more specific with other parts of the website. Because a lot of what we've looked at is what was right at the top of people's websites. And what about the rest? How do we focus on turning the website into a sales machine? One approach you can take to turn your website into a sales machine is have your call to action in more than one place. You definitely wanna have it at the upper right-hand corner because of the way people start at the left and go to the right really quickly. And then you, then you wanna have it again, just before the scroll point, which is called the fold, or just after. 
And you want to repeat in several other places too, because when people start scrolling down your website to look at it, you don't want them to have to go back up to take the action. So it may feel like this is ridiculous to have all these places that have your call to action, but it's not because the easier you make it for them to take the action, the better. This again is the five minute marketing makeover. You can see that they had one in the section above that was light gray, and then they have it in the section below that's white. So I purposely straddled two sections so you could see how they repeat it. Another option you have are menus that don't move. So people always have access to that call to action if it's in the upper right hand corner. This is what Evernote does. That menu at the top of the screen does not move no matter how much you scroll. Another option you have is for super simple menus because the simpler your menus are, the more likely people are to look at them. Now Evernote has an interesting choice here. This one particular sub menu has eight choices, which is a lot. The rest of them only had about two or three. But you'll notice that they also have a choice at the bottom that says see all features. So if somebody only cares about, about sync and organize, keep your notes handy, they can just click on the one. Or if somebody just wants to scan documents and go paperless, they could click on that one. But if they care about everything and they're like, oh, cool, I want to see what it all does, they can click on the button that says see all features. So Although this is a little bit busy, the design itself is really clean. It makes it easy to see the choices because they've got logos, symbols, and then you've got to see all features if you're somebody who likes to do all that. But again, most of their menus are simpler and most really good websites that have menus make them really simple. All right, now we're talking about telling your story. Again, how can you tell your story? We went into detail last workshop. This one is about what does it look like on your website? All right, this company, United Steel, this is on their homepage where it's saying a little bit about us. This is extremely well done because this is saying, you can trust us. We'll help you be awesome. Now. What I want to tell you is that it's great to have a small bit of your story about you on your homepage with the focus being how you can help someone else. And then you can have a longer version of your story on your about page because the about page generally is the second most visited page on someone's website. And some people go there as soon as they click on the home and see a thing that says about us because they, they're curious and they want to know something about you. So you want to be careful on your about page because you do have to talk about yourself, but you still want to position yourself as the guide to them as the hero so that you want to tell about yourself so you show that you're empathetic and that you're an expert so that you can help them develop into the hero that they want to be. And so this company did an extremely great job on their homepage with their about. But then when you go to their actual about us, it is only about them. So this is not so great because it's not really speaking to the customer. They might think that their mission about experienced staff of estimators, engineers, blah, 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 is really, really super important and interesting, but it's probably not so much. All right, another section that is important is testimonials because this is where you demonstrate who has already used your product and service and has benefited from that product or service. Testimonials can be super simple like logos. They can also include what the customer has said, like this one. This one happens to be a carousel. And so as you go, as it goes, it highlights the next company and has a quote that that company said about their product. And it can even be in video form. So testimonials can look any way you want. Now, the more expensive your product or service, 
the more actual quotes are helpful as long as you haven't made them up. You want them to be real, real quotes from real customers. Now, if you are just starting your business and you have no real customers, then what you need to do is give away your product to someone and then ask them what they thought of it. You do not want to give it away and tell them I'm going to ask for a testimonial so that they tell you something nice because you gave it to them for free. It's got to be real, a real transaction and a real honest feedback. So hyperbole, people have a very strong sniffer for hyperbole. So do not allow hyperbole to show up on your website. For example, I have fr I'm friends with authors who often have a launch team and they say, will you read the copy of my book in advance for so that so that you can put an Amazon review on the day that it comes out on Amazon. Now, if every single person puts a five star review because they feel like, oh, we've got to really support this author, it backfires because no author gets 100 percent five star reviews. Just doesn't happen. So you want honest reviews. You want honest feedback. You want people to give you honest feedback. And it's just as true on your website. If somebody doesn't have something great to say, then just don't put what they had to say. Never, ever, ever make stuff up. All right, so this has been a lot so far. And so what I want you to do is tell yourself, I do not have to focus on everything on my website. I want to focus on the main things, which we're going to reiterate here again so you don't go, oh my gosh, this is so much stuff. The overall design aesthetic and the responsiveness. Remember the Z10 rule, the Z shape and 10 seconds. If you can't pay a designer for to design for your website, then use a design tool like canva.com. They have templates that look great. And we're going to actually do a class on Canva in a later Lunch and Learn module sometime in the fall. Responsiveness is the responsibility of the web developer. And if you use Wix or Shopify or some paid WordPress templates, they should automatically scale and reshape themselves because that's what you're paying for. If you pay someone to develop a website from scratch, it should be included. You wanna make sure that responsiveness is included in the cost. And you wanna test with multiple people on multiple types of phones and multiple tablets as well as different zoom ratios on your laptop browser. Because if you change it from 100% to 70%, you want the stuff to scale appropriately and not just shrink it down super small so that no one can read anything. The second thing that's really important is your call to action, which is why I've repeated it so many times. Know what you want them to do when they land on your site and make that the call to action. And then once they click on the button, make it easy for them to do what comes next. If it's schedule a call, then have a simple form with the minimum of information needed to get it going, because you can always ask for more information in a second stage or an embedded scheduler or something. If it's to buy, make the store clean, not cluttered. If it's to sign up for your for your for an email, Make it easy. Do not require a ton of information. Now, if the call to action is call us to schedule an appointment or schedule an appointment, once they click on that button and they get to the page where you're telling them what it is they're going to do or you have the form or whatever, you can always have a contingent call to action at the bottom that says something like, you're not quite ready to take action, sign up for my email list and get a free whatever you want to give them away. So that's how you can have more than one to call to action, is if you have your primary one, which is a bigger ask, 
And then if they're not quite ready to take that step because it's a little bit too scary, then as a fallback position, well, at least get on my email list and I'll give you this free guide to something, something or whatever. So that's number two, call to action. And the third one is clarity. Clear language, clear communication spoken to one audience in words they would use as if you were having a conversation with them. And focus two places, your homepage and your about page. Don't worry too much about the rest of the stuff because if you hook them in those beginning, they'll be a lot more forgiving about everything else. So it's the, it's the catching their interest and making them decide, oh, I want to take some action and I want to know this person more. And then, like I say, it's a lot more forgiving after that. So if you focus on those three things, you're going to be way ahead of the game. So, and again, focus on telling the story of the customer and not yourself, which I've repeated multiple times, but I cannot say it enough because we all fall back to telling the story about me. And it's tricky to tell the story about them while you're telling the story about yourself. So if you do the three things that you see on this screen, your website will be better than most websites. So the bottom line is, who's coming here? What do they want? And those first two, if you do get that right, they help them see themselves and go, oh, he or she totally gets me. I can tell in 10 seconds, they totally get me and they know what I want. And then the third question is, how can you help? And that helps them see how you can help them either solve their problem or improve their status. Because remember, the purpose of your website is to make sales. So you can help as many ideal customers as possible. The more time someone spends on your site, the more likely it is that you're going to make sales. And you only have 10 seconds to make a first impression, so you want to make the most of it. All right, what's next after this workshop? Look at other websites in your market and look at them and evaluate them based on the principles that I've taught here today, especially if you don't have a website already. You can see what might be great or not so great about other websites in your industry. If you do have a website, you can evaluate your own website using the principles we talked about today and using the resource that's on the screen, which was 5minutemarketingmakeover.com. And there's also two others, Canva, which is the tool that I talked about with design. And then there's a podcast put out by the same people that do five minute marketing. Podcast episode 13 of Marketing Made Simple is all about your website. So you could listen to that podcast episode and it's great. Second, thirdly, lost track of numbers. Thirdly, you can talk this through with someone else. Have someone else look at your website, a friend, a colleague, or a SCORE mentor. Now, you may or may not already have a SCORE mentor. So we're gonna do a poll. Steve's gonna put up a poll saying, do you have a mentor? Yes, no. And if you don't, would you like one? No problem if you do or you don't. We just wanna know because if you don't have a mentor yet and you would like to know how to work with a mentor, we will send you an email and tell you how you can find a mentor. Meanwhile, it's time for the Q&A. So whatever's in the Q&A box, we will start with. And there's still time to post there if you would like. And remember, if you have a question that's a little more confidential, you can earmark it that way and we will save it until after we stop the recording. But now's your time. And if you have a question that might be a little more involved, you can raise your hand and you can ask it out loud and we will, we will invite you to unmute yourself. So. We'll keep the poll open for another second and then end it. Meanwhile, we can start the Q&A. All right, that was great, Kathleen. Um, so if you have any questions related to today's topic, please uh, feel free to put it in the Q&A box and I will, uh, I will monitor that. We did get a suggestion from Christine at the very top of the webinar about a future topic. So thank you, Christine, for that. It was about pricing. So we will earmark that for a future session. Um, 
Kathleen, we did get a, a question about this. I know that this is primarily focused on the marketing aspect of a website, but any uh, thoughts are on security concerns that people should be considering in uh, setting up their website from just any experience you've got, either yourself or with other clients? Well, primarily security concerns are going to be around data. So what you're serving up on your website, it, you don't really have to worry about security. It's more what you're asking someone else to do. If all they're doing is clicking on a link which and putting in their email address, you still want that to be secure. And, and, and you also want to make sure that any tool that's sending someone off the site itself that's going to a plug-in or something, some other site, like for instance, if you use an email system that when people sign up for your, for your email list, it's actually going to your email system. You wanna make sure that email system is secure. And if you're buying one off the shelf, they are. They have to be secure. So where, where security really matters on your site more is any data that you are collecting about the person that is going to be housed on the site itself. And also if you have a store where you're taking credit card information and selling stuff. And in that case, you better make sure that your website is HTTPS and has security over it automatically. Secondly, if you are using any third-party integration with something like Square or Stripe or any, or um, PayPal, those sites have to be secure too. So as long as your site is secured and their site is secured, you're okay. The last one, and this one's gonna be a lot harder to suss out, is where you do your hosting. My personal preference would be to do hosting with somebody who's bigger rather than some guy who develops your website and hosts it on their own server. Because the, the data security on the server itself, which is where the data really sits on your website, is only as secure as the server. So, so yes, it, I know there are people who develop websites for other people and then they also host it themselves. And I'm not a big fan of that because I'm concerned about, I don't, I can't prove how good the security is. Where if it's a larger company and they say, I know anything can be hacked, but it's a lot harder with larger companies that have much stricter requirements for hosting. And I hope that helps. That's good. That's a good answer. Um, we also got a question from Anna about, um, do you have any advice about writing a privacy policy for your website? Is there a template that SCORE recommends or do you need to hire an attorney? Oh boy, that's a really good question. I do not have a template. I do not think that SCORE has a template. I don't think you need to hire an attorney. This would be one where if you scope out other people in your business, you can use it as a basic template and then modify it slightly. And I can almost guarantee if you Google it, there will be some somewhat simplified because keep in mind, this is going to somewhat depend on your industry. If you are in the financial industry or the health industry, you've got to be really strict because you have either a fiduciary responsibility or whatever they call the responsibility as a healthcare provider. If you're not one of those two or something else that's highly regulated like that, it can be much simpler. And there, I can almost guarantee you there are templates out there that you could avail yourself of. In that, in when it's when it's that, you want to make it as simple as possible. And the other thing you want to make sure you pay attention to is GDPR, which is the whole European privacy stuff which if your website is available or what you're doing is available to people overseas, you have to make sure you comply with that, which has to do with cookies and all of that. Stuff. And it's also true in California. So 
the cookie policy and the privacy policy in terms of giving people options to click, not click on stuff with respect to cookies is also critical, which I didn't think to put in this workshop. So thank you for asking the question. That's a great thing. Thanks, Anna, for asking mm -hmm. that. And, and Anna responded, thank you for your answer. And I think I, I couldn't think of any better advice than what you just said, Kathleen. I agree. I don't think there's a template I'm aware of, but I think researching other businesses in your industry mm -hmm. is really smart because you know, they've probably done a lot of the legwork on that and researching if you're in a, in a regulated industry, researching what the requirements are. Um, we don't have any other questions in the Q&A box, but I actually had one myself as you were going through your presentation that I thought of, and I'm interested in your perspective on this. Um, oftentimes when I go to a website, I'll see something, I'll see a, um, a, uh, a, a pop-up box where it's join our mailing list or mm -hmm. click here for a 10% off offer. And if it's a site that I visit frequently, sometimes I wonder, is it overkill? Um, do you have any opinion on that or any thoughts on that? I have a lot of opinions about pop-up boxes. They work and I hate them. And most, most customers, if you ask them, they would say they hate them, but it usually doesn't stop them from visiting someone's website. So I think partly it depends on what your business is. If your business is all about empathy and caring, I would not do pop-up boxes because it's antithetical to your brand. Like to me, that's just, that's just saying, I'm going to do whatever I can to get you to click on something, which is not what your brand is about. If your, if your brand is more about take advantage of something that's, that's the newest and greatest, latest and greatest, I might do a pop-up box. It's really up to you. They do work. Um, and there's also ways to make them sophisticated so that if you've been to my site recently and you come back, it won't ever show up. You can also make it so that, and again, this takes more sophistication, but it's technically feasible, that if you are my email subscriber and you click on my website from my email that I sent you, it will not show the pop-up box because it recognizes you as a subscriber. So there are ways to make it so that it's less annoying. And you can also make it so that it only shows if it looks like someone's leaving. And anything you can do to make it less annoying, if you're going to do it, I would say do. Because myself, I often click away when I see pop-up boxes, even if I like the thing. Mm -hmm. But not everybody's like that. Some people love it because it's like, oh, now I don't even have to do any work. So yeah. it's, you got a way, like think about you, think about your audience, think about what it is you're doing and decide for yourself, do I want to do it at all? And if so, how can I make it so it's less and less and less annoying, but, and still get some kind of bang for the buck? Yeah. It's, it's almost like, um, I'm thinking about two aspects here. One is, you know, giving them prominent access to an offer, but maybe it's not covering 90% of the screen, you know, yes. and, and, and to, and really turning them off in terms of when they look at it. Mm -hmm. The other thing I thought about in respect to this is when earlier you were talking about putting yourself in the shoes of the customer, right? What do you look like, or what do you like when you go to websites of businesses that you want to frequent and what do you not like and making sure you tailor that. And then you talked about getting advice from other business owners or friends or family just say, hey, poke around my website. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And that may be a good way to get some feedback on that as well. Especially if you give no direction and you just say, and then you ask them, what do you think this is for? And what do you think you're supposed to do if anything when you get here? Yeah. And it, with no prompting, and it'll be interesting to see what you get for responses. <laughs> Oh, Sandy had a question about shoestring marketing. Um, just kind of help on that. I'm not sure if that's really applicable to this uh, today's topic. I'm not sure what shoestring marketing is. Just, you know, advice for trying to do marketing on a shoestring budget, which I don't really oh. think is applicable to kind of making your sales site work for, uh, making your website work for sales. Yeah, no. 
No. I would say um, that would be a good conversation to have with a score mentor for sure. Mm 